Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm Emily Callan. Let's begin this episode one last time with the Holy Father's reflection at the general audience. It was his last one before the summer break. Although the Pope doesn't go on vacation, his schedule will be a bit more relaxed over the next several weeks. At least, there will be no general audience until August. And so, to end this cycle, he focused once again on the virtue of Christian hope. And, like the martyrs, hope found in the midst of hardship. Here is a summary of his catechesis this week. The Lord himself warned his followers that, in proclaiming the kingdom of God, they would enter opposition and hostility in this world of sin and injustice. Jesus asks his disciples to proclaim the gospel by their lives of detachment from wealth and power and by their rejection of the spiral of hatred, violence and retaliation and by their trust in his triumph over the power of sin and death. As his followers, we know that the Lord will never abandon us. By imitating the example of his own self-sacrifice and love, we demonstrate our faith and hope in him, and we become his witnesses before the world. In this sense, every Christian is a martyr, a witness to the sure hope that faith inspires. The martyrs who even today lay down their lives for the faith do so out of love. By their example and intercession, may we become ever more convincing witnesses, above all in the events of our daily lives, to our undying hope in the promises of Christ. The Holy Father received a delegation from the Patriarchate of Constantinople on Tuesday. This happens every year on the occasion of the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, celebrated on June 29th. This year also marked the 50th anniversary of Pope Paul VI's visit to Istanbul and that of Patriarch Athenagoras to Rome in 1967. In an address to the ecumenical delegation, Pope Francis mentioned the courage of these far-sighted pastors moved solely by love for Christ and his church, which encourages us, he added, to press forward in our journey towards full unity. He also spoke about the experience of the first millennium, which is a necessary reference point and a source of inspiration for our efforts to restore full communion between Catholics and Orthodox. Peter and Paul served the Lord in two different ways, but who nonetheless testify to God's merciful love. A Catholic bishop in China was taken by authorities last May. However, there has been no information as to why this happened and where he is. Vatican spokesperson Greg Burke made a statement on his disappearance on Monday, saying the Vatican is deeply concerned with the situation involving the removal of Bishop Peter Shao Zumin from his diocese. The Holy See, Burke said, is profoundly saddened for this and other similar episodes that unfortunately do not facilitate ways of understanding and hopes he can return as soon as possible to the diocese and exercise his ministry. The Vatican is inviting people to pray for Bishop Shao Zumin and for the Catholic Church in China. The Pope will be making a trip to Colombia next September. The Vatican confirmed this visit last weekend. He will be spending four days in the country between September 6th and the 10th, and it is the Holy Father's 20th apostolic visit outside of Italy. He is the third Pope to visit Colombia, and he goes one year after the signing of the peace agreement between the government and the Revolutionary Army of Colombia. This week's Tweet of the Week is, Each one of us is precious. Each one of us is irreplaceable in God's eyes. 
Cardinal George Pell, Prefect of the Secretariat for the Economy, has denied multiple charges against him regarding historical sexual abuse offenses, meaning they allegedly happened many years ago while he was still in Australia. Cardinal Pell, before being appointed to the Secretariat of the Economy in 2013, was Archbishop of Sydney and before then Archbishop of Melbourne. He is scheduled to appear in court on July 18th. Following the announcement of these charges, Cardinal Pell, 76 years old, made a statement. I am innocent of these charges, he said in a press conference Thursday morning at the Vatican. Vatican spokesperson Greg Burke was also present in the Holy See press office and spoke briefly. Here is a clip from the press conference from Catholic News Service. The Holy See has learned with regret the news of charges filed against Cardinal George Pell for decades old actions that have been attributed to him. Having become aware of the charges, Cardinal Pell, <laughs> acting in full respect <coughs> for civil laws, has decided to return to his country to face the charges against him, recognizing the importance of his participation to ensure that the process is carried out fairly and to foster the search for truth. The Holy Father, having been informed by Cardinal Pell, has granted the Cardinal a leave of absence so he can defend himself. Uh, good morning to you all. I want to say one or two brief words about my situation. Uh, these matters have been under investigation uh, now for two years. There have been leaks to the media. There have been, there's been relentless character assassination, a relentless character assassination. And for more than a month, claims that a, a decision on whether to lay charges um, was imminent. I'm looking forward, finally, to having my day in court. Uh, I'm innocent of these charges. They are false. The whole idea of sexual abuse is abhorrent to me. I've uh, kept uh, Pope Francis, the Holy Father, regularly informed uh, during these uh, long months and I have spoken to him on a number uh, of occasions uh, in the last uh, week, I think uh, most recently a day or so ago. And we talked about uh, my need to take leave to clear my name. So I'm very grateful to the Holy Father for giving me this leave to return to Australia. I've spoken to my lawyers about uh, when this will be necessary, and I've spoken to my doctors about the best way uh, to uh, achieve this. All along, I have been completely consistent and clear in my total rejection of these allegations. News of these charges strengthens my resolve, strengthens my resolve. And court proceedings now offer me an opportunity to clear my name and then return here uh, back to Rome to work. Thank you. On Wednesday in St. Peter's Basilica, Pope Francis created five new cardinals. They're from Mali, Spain, Switzerland, Laos, and El Salvador. Four out of those five countries got a cardinal for the first time, namely Archbishop Jean Zerbeau from Mali, Bishop Anders Aborelius from Switzerland, Bishop Louis-Marie Ling Makinakum from Laos, and Bishop Gregorio Rosa Chavez from El Salvador. The fifth is Archbishop Juan Jose Omeya from Spain. During the ceremony, the Pope bestowed on them the beretta, ring, and a title. And then he gave the homily and centered it on the gospel reading from St. Mark. CNS prepared this piece from the celebration and got to speak to two of the newly minted cardinals. At well, the beginning, I didn't, uh, I didn't believe it because you know, somebody called me by, by phone. Did you, Grandfather, you are uh, elected by the uh, Pope to be a cardinal. 
I said, don't worry about me, <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> I didn't believe it. In particular, I revolvo a voi, carissimi nuovi cardinali. Gesù cammina davanti a voi e vi chiede di seguirlo decisamente sulla sua vita. Vi chiama a guardare la realtà, a non lasciarvi distrarre dagli altri interessi, da altre prospettive. Lui non vi ha chiamati a diventare principi nella Chiesa, a sedere alla sua destra o alla sua sinistra. Vi chiama a servire come Lui e con Lui. Servire il Padre e i fratelli. Vi chiama ad affrontare con il suo stesso atteggiamento il peccato del mondo e le sue conseguenze nell'umanità di oggi. Seguendo Lui, anche voi camminate davanti al popolo santo di Dio, tenendo fisso lo sguardo alla, cru alla croce e alla risurrezione del Signore. Bueno, yo sigo, esto no, esto no da autoridad, es un cargo que da, da honor, presidencia por una autoridad. Yo sigo siendo obispo auxiliar de, de mi arzobispo, Monsignor José Luis Escobar. We are not constituted as authority or, you know, high ranking or something like that. We have to be in at service. At service, it means, you know, to respond to the needs of the, of the church, that's all. This week also marked the 25th anniversary of Pope Francis's Episcopal ordination. He was ordained in Buenos Aires as Auxiliary Bishop, so he celebrated Mass in the Pauline Chapel at the Apostolic Palace with the College of Cardinals, those who are at least in Rome. He presided the Eucharistic celebration and gave a homily where he referred to the bishops as grandfathers. Here's a clip from his homily from CNS. Qualcuno che non ci vuole bene, dice di noi che siamo la gerontocrazia della Chiesa. È una beffa, non capisce quello che dice. Noi non siamo geronti, siamo dei nonni. Siamo dei nonni e se non sentiamo questo dobbiamo chiedere la grazia di sentirlo. Dei nonni al quale i nostri nipotini guardano. Dei nonni che, che dobbiamo dare a loro un senso della vita con la nostra esperienza. Nonni non chiusi nella mal malinconia de del la storia nostra, ma aperti per dare quello. E per noi questa alzati, guarda, spera, si chiama sognare. Noi siamo dei nonni chiamati a sognare e dare il nostro sogno alla gioventù di oggi. Ne ha bisogno perché loro prenderanno dai nostri sogni la forza per profetizzare e portare avanti i loro compiti. Now, since we are at the end of another season with Vatican Connections, it means we can look back and highlight some of the main events from this past year. Certainly, lots has happened since January already, but one of the Holy Father's most anticipated visits was his pilgrimage to Fatima to celebrate the centenary of the Marian apparitions to three shepherd children. The event opened the door for questions concerning supernatural phenomena, their significance, their validity, and so on. So naturally, Medjugorje was brought up, a commission was established by Pope Benedict XVI, but no decision has been made yet because of the 
complexity of the apparitions and visions. Yet, on his return flight from Fatima, the Pope clearly stated his opinion. But does this change anything? How does the Church, in fact, determine the validity of supernatural phenomena? To talk about this, John Davis, renowned Vatican journalist, is on the show this week, and you might have already seen him on Subject Matters with Sebastian Gomes. He is the author of a new book called The Vatican Prophecies, Investigating Supernatural Signs, Apparitions, and Miracles in the Modern Age. Hi, John. It's great to have you on the show today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So first of all, in early May, Pope Francis was coming back from Fatima, and he was asked about the investigation surrounding Medjugorje. And his answer was pretty clear. He said, concerning the alleged current apparitions, the report expresses doubt. Personally, I am more mischievous. I prefer Our Lady to be a mother our mother and not a telegraph operator who sends out a message every day at a certain time. This is not the mother of Jesus, and these alleged apparitions have no great value. I say this as my personal opinion. So the Pope clearly said this was his personal opinion, but how much does that opinion affect what will be the Vatican's decision on the veracity of the Medjugorje apparitions? I think it's very important. Uh, you know, it was amazing that Pope Francis actually answered the question and decided to say something. Previous popes have avoided this for 35 years, and uh, because they know that anything they say will have repercussions throughout the people who are very supportive of Medjugorje or who have questioned it. Well, he's the pope, and as pope, he's the one who ultimately is going to pronounce on what the church believes uh, happened and is happening at Medjugorje. Now, I found his answer to be interesting. It's, it seems that the Pope and some Vatican officials uh, almost want to have it both ways. They want to say something good happened at Medjugorje initially when the children uh, claimed to have seen Mary. But then the idea is that as the years went on, as the Pope put it, outs were raised. And that would be something rather new and different for the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, consistency has always been a hallmark of authenticity when it comes to apparitions. And, you know, I, I think it would be a little problematic if the Church says, well, it was authentic at the beginning, but then something happened. Uh, in any case, we, we clearly have the Pope who says, What's going on now, he doesn't believe, is authentic. And that's got to have an impact on the final uh, statement that com comes out of the Vatican. What makes this particular phenomenon so much more complex and fragile than, let's say, Fatima, Lourdes, and even Guadalupe? Well, what makes it especially complex is that these apparitions have supposedly been going on for, what, 36 years now and are still happening, according to the visionaries. Uh, Mary's still appearing daily to three of the visionaries. Uh, now, of course, they've gone their separate ways. The kids are no longer kids. They're not going up to a mountain together to see Mary. They're leading their own normal lives, and some of them have moved to different countries or different continents. So it, it's a strange situation. You have Mary appearing to you know, in various places, to various people, at various times, giving separate messages. And, you know, at this point, the Vatican's experts are saying, well, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Because the one thing they look for when there are appearances of Mary is, what is the message? Why does Mary feel it so urgent to appear to mankind? And that's why most apparitions uh, have been very brief and, you know, or, or stretched out over a, a definite period of time. You don't really have a situation of open-ended apparitions that go on for the life of the individuals. And that's what we appear to have at Medjugorje. Uh, so again, that's the complexity here. And that's why I think the Vatican will not issue any definitive statement until the apparitions end. 
because the Vatican's not going to say yes or no uh, while Mary allegedly is still giving out messages every day. How does the church approach supernatural phenomena, especially in this case with Marian apparitions and revelations? Well, the church, of course, has a long tradition of investigating uh, what we call supernatural occurrences or, or even mystical experiences. And generally, the church tries to guide a visionary very closely and very carefully. The first thing the church asks is that the visionary submit himself or herself to spiritual guidance of the church. And oftentimes, the approach is to keep it quiet and not seek publicity. In fact, seeking publicity is, has been seen as a, as a sign of inauthenticity in these experiences. Church looks for negative things like, are people profiting by this? Uh, is this being used politically or to fight some kind of other battles? Uh, the church looks at the private lives of the visionaries and it says, you know, are these people uh, honest people? Are they moral people? And so they, they look at a, a number of factors. They look for factual, uh, you know, rational proof or, or at least evidence that what they claimed happened actually happened. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of levels of investigation. I will say this. One thing the Catholic Church through the centuries has tried to do is keep things quiet for as long as possible. And in, as we know, in the modern day and age, which is the age of the Internet, it is very hard to keep supernatural occurrences private and quiet. So anytime you have uh, an alleged apparition of Mary, it is going to be online probably that very day, and you're going to have millions of people knowing about it or hearing about it that in previous times would never have heard about it. So it is much harder for the church to keep things under wraps. And I think that's the experience of Medjugorje. Well, thanks again for being with us and for shedding some light on this very complex issue. It's my pleasure. Thank you. First of all, the pallium is a piece of liturgical vestment worn by metropolitan archbishops and primates over their chasubles. It is made out of lamb's wool and decorated with six black crosses. Oftentimes, gold pins are placed upon it. It dates back to the 4th century and is traditionally bestowed on archbishops on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. 36 of them have been appointed and received their pallium in St. Peter's Square on Thursday during a Eucharistic celebration presided as well by the Holy Father. Today, the Pope blesses the palliums during a Mass in Rome, and then when the archbishops return to their home country, the Papal Nuncio bestows it upon them during another Mass in their cathedral. So what is the meaning of all of this? Well, three American bishops who were in Rome this week for the blessing of the pallium explained its significance to Catholic News Service. What struck me when I, when I wanted to receive the pallium is the Holy Father, Pope Francis had a glow. I, I kept watching him during the mass with his pallium, thinking the universality of his pallium. You know, we wear ours in, in the province. He, he wears it throughout the world so that as I watched him in, in that whole role of being the shepherd, you know, and being called now to go forth and be that shepherd uh, for the people entrusted to my care. It's symbolic of the yoke of the gospel. It's symbolic of the wool, the lambs, the sheep that are entrusted to our care that we carry. And that my role is to be a good shepherd to them, is to help the people entrusted to my pastoral care learn to live in unity and peace, to manifest that truth and love of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And that's how we all live in communion with the Universal Church and with our Holy Father. Probably all the stuff that I have to wear. You know, uh, John the 23rd said that cardinals and bishops are the coat hangers on which the church hangs its tradition. Now, I don't mind being a coat hanger, but the thing I like to wear the most is the pallium. Because one of the meanings of it 
is because it's made out of lamb's wool is the need and really the obligation of the bishop to look for the one who's lost and then bring the lost one back on his shoulders and uh, I hope to do that. Before we sign off for the summer, I'd like to give special thanks to our weekly correspondent Matteo Ciofi, Salt and Light's Italian journalist, to Deborah Castellano-Lubov, Zenit correspondent at the Vatican for in-depth commentary on Vatican events throughout the year, and of course to Catholic News Service and Vatican Television, thanks to whom we were able to fill the show with visually rich content. And that's our show for this week and for this season. If you would like to watch any of our previous shows, please visit Vatican Connections webpage at saltandlighttv.org slash Vatican Connections. We at Salt and Light would also love to get your feedback on the program and the content we produced this past season. So to tell us how we're doing, please visit saltandlighttv.org slash VC Survey to send your comments directly to the programming team. Thanks again for watching and I hope you have a great summer.